All right, folks. Good morning. Good morning. I've got three extras here. Does anybody need an extra? Yeah, there's some extra ones out there. To my car, maybe. Okay. Hey guys. Need one here? They shock you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, if you were to like stand around the corner, I could just say boo. That would shock you too, right? Yeah. yeah. Boo. Would that That's be enough? They say. they say, well, we can put a cold, you know, you can go on a cold bath and shock your heart. Really? really? That was a serious suggestion? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay, that must be the olden days. Yeah, wow. Well, so we will keep your medical procedure. When, is that it this week? Yeah. All right, we'll keep that in our prayers today. Good, let's pray. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. Uh, we see the sun shining, and, and we are reminded of your great love for us, how you take care of us. Uh, we ask for you uh, to look after uh, Marlene in her medical procedure this week, that it would be successful and and uh, that uh, her uh, heart would be okay and strengthened and able uh, to uh, provide her body with what it needs so that she can continue to serve you and her family, her loved ones. Bless our time in your word today as we seek to understand how to apply it to the way we worship so that everything we do might be done for your honor and glory. Bless us, Lord. Amen. All right. Last time... Um, we ended by talking about uh, pietism. Can anybody remember um, why did pietism develop? What was the kind of the catalyst for pietism? Anybody remember the discussion we had last time? It's okay if you don't. Just trying to work off a little bit of rust there. Good, the Thirty Years' War, so we had a lot of conflict in Europe, religious conflict, and we had this cold orthodoxy. Remember that cold orthodoxy, where the pastors knew their stuff, but they didn't know necessarily how to be pastoral with their members. So it was all just about getting it right, and it didn't matter if you had it, you know, if the, the person needed pastoral care, just we are just going to stand on those denominational lines and um, stop caring about souls. So that's, I'm probably exaggerating that a little bit, but that kind of generally contributed to the, uh, the spiritual decline of the churches. So pietism came along as a reaction to that because you had people that were spending, they, they decided um, that it would be good to get back into God's word, uh, focus on Christian living, outreach, missionary work, um, all of that. Uh, the fellow, if you're into names, remembering names would be uh, Philip Jacob Spainer, uh, Spainer, uh, Lutheran pastor, and he kind of developed this into more official with these kind of groups that would meet together in Bible study and things like that. What wound up happening, though, was the emphasis became upon my work, 
my response to the gospel and um, and the focus it it got off from God's word and the means of grace and so um, and so whenever you do that right whenever you lose focus on Jesus um, then uh, you no longer have the, the proper motivation for serving Jesus right it just becomes about this thing that you do okay so that's a quick review of pietism um, <coughs> excuse me so uh, we're kind of just picking it up here uh, if you're just filling in your notes on uh, actually you know what by, by fortune's chance here I think about an extra one thank you <laughs> um, we're on the back of the front page pietism and worship Why was it wrong for pietism to blame the means of grace for the so-called dead orthodoxy? So, so they looked at what was going on, and they said, we can't do, you know, we can't worship the way we've been worshiping because it hasn't worked. And so we have to get away from that, which was essentially saying, we can't trust the means of grace to do that. Why was it wrong for them to say that? I know it seems obvious. <laughs> yeah. What? What? Um, That's the way the Lord works through our concern. Right. So, so to blame the means of grace for the situation going on in the church is like saying guns kill people. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's it's blaming the wrong thing. Right. It's 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 putting that blame. In the wrong spot, so they were, you know, they were right to look at the situation going on in the church and say, "Boy, this is not good." But they they figured out, or they their conclusion that they made um, about it wasn't good. Jacob, you had your hand up. Sorry, did it go? Um, it's God instituted Jesus instituted um, everything in the means of grace. Yeah. So. It's a pretty it makes good sense to blame the means of grace and say that it's wrong when the means of grace was instituted by the person that they were worshiping. Okay, right. Yeah. Fair <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> <house. laughs> right. That's why we put them on our table. Yeah. <laughs> well, so if you can remember when Adam and Eve fell into sin, remember Adam says, oh, this woman you put here with me, right? Whoa, <laughs> whoa, God, <laughs> whoa, Adam, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're treading on some pretty thin ice there, right? And it's essentially the same thing. Okay, so what winds up happening then in pietism as a result of all this is you're, you're trying to figure out what is truth, right? So if you're in a philosophy class in college, that's kind of the big question you're always struggling with, is how do you come up with truth? How do you come up with reality? What is what is true? And, I mean, and, and people are all over the map on this these days. Um, Jacob will remind you that we live in a relativistic society. We just studied that in catechism class. Um, and so, you know, truth is kind of up for grabs, right? What you want it to be. Um, so in, in pietism, truth was sort of built very similarly on this foundation of personal experience. So your personal experience um, had a lot to do, you know, with, with your piety. How pious are you? And that's, that's where it gets its name, pietism, right? How pious are you? Are you good enough? Are you sincere enough? Did you do enough mission work? Um, all of those things. So, um, so what you're going to say? What you're going to see happening in congregations that, and this was all in Europe, uh, that kind of embraced Pietism, um, is is we got to we're going to get rid of things. What are we going to get rid of? Oops, oh, what happened? Um, well, hymns, for one thing, because all these good German Lutheran hymns, all they do is point you back to Jesus, back to these, these doctrines, these teachings that got us into this mess, 
right? So, so we can't have that. So less congregational singing, less hymns, fewer hymns. Um, we're gonna we're gonna get rid of um, uh, evangelical preaching, and let's this evangelical. Maybe I should have used a different word. I'm just trying to be friendly. Um, we hear in our our 21st century ears hear, hear evangelical. We think Billy Graham. We think Baptist. We think you know, Campus Crusade for Christ. All those evangelical groups. Um, when I say evangelical, I mean Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Evangel, gospel centered, centered on Christ, the good news, the evangelion. That's the Greek word for you know the gospel, right? Above the uh, the uh, chapel, um, as you go into the seminary chapel in Wisconsin, at Wisconsin the seminary says "Kerixitato evangelion," right? Preach the gospel, preach the good news. Constant reminder to us. Oh, sorry. This way. <laughs> no, I was just saying I could I could never read it. Yeah, it's in Greek. There, but it's part of the secret club. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the inner sanctum. That's right. That's where we learn. What what what's it? What's the first one, Elijah? <laughs> the, the secret handshakes. All right, we're getting off track. <laughs> Okay, um, so we're going to get rid of those great German Lutheran hymns. Um, we're going to get rid of evangelical preaching that, you know, that, that spoke about this is what Jesus has done, because again, that smacked of, of being doctrinaire, that smacked of, of forcing religion on people. Um, and we're going to add, what we're going to add here is... Um, <coughs> More emotional things. Uh, more emotional services. Why is that such an appeal? What, what, I mean, we see it happen all the time. Why is, if we pull, if, if our personal experience, our piety is the basis for truth, why, why does this emotional thing become such a draw? It's fun. It's fun, okay. You're participating more openly. So um, you're participating more, you get yourself worked up. So um, there is a, uh, um, wh wherever you land as a pastor, there's always like a ministry association. And they cautioned us about these at the seminary. Ministry associations are kind of pan-religious groups. Any church can be a part of them. So you gotta be careful. Sometimes they can be useful because you can make connections to the community and stuff like that. But there's also a lot of fellowship issues involved with those. So Associated Ministries of Washington um, is, is hosting um, a presentation from uh, a fellow out east. I can't, man, I can't remember his name. Um, but he's, uh, he does a, a worship service uh, in his congregation. Uh, very, you know, kind of black revivalist feel to the whole thing. Like, we're going to revive. And uh, so he does a, about an hour and a half called the Boiler, Hot Boiler, Boiler Room Prayer. The boiler room prayer hour, and it's him clapping his hands, and praying, and just getting y'all fired up. Bah, we're gonna get you into church, ah, you know, just all the kind of just all that stuff, bah, you know, just really, yeah. And he's just clapping, and he's getting everybody riled up, and you got people in the audience, they're moaning, and you know, it's just it is very emotional, like even. As just a very conservative, somewhat restrained white Lutheran pastor, I was sort of like, yeah, okay, man, I'll get into this kind, right? So it tends to kind of draw you in, right? There's this part of us that just really, uh, so, so that was his hour of prayer. And then he does kind of a, a church service. So I, I was watching a little bit of that, and it's pretty much him just on fire for Jesus for about an hour and a half. And uh, he got so exhausted preaching, he actually had to sit down <laughs> and preach the rest of the sermon because he was just worn out from all that emotionalism. So, now I don't mean, I'm not bashing here, I'm just saying there's a big draw to this, isn't there? A big draw. Um, so, isn't that kind of like what our mindset is that, oh, in order to feel like we're forgiven, we should be woohoo! Yes, okay, so that leads to kind of the next thing um, that they talked about, which was this. <clears throat> You have to have a personal consciousness 
of your conversion. Okay? You have to have a conversion experience. If you ever worked your way through C.F.W. Walther's Law and Gospel, the proper distinction between Law and Gospel, good Lutheran text, you know, worth reading, not exactly, you know, light reading, but good, solid Lutheran, biblical, evangelical teaching. He grew up, he grew up in pietism. He experienced that. And a lot of people he grew up with and went to school with would often talk, well, what's your conversion experience, right? So if you're thinking to yourself, well, that sounds a little bit like modern day kind of testimony, right? This idea of giving your testimony of how you went from unbelief to belief. Um, those of you who kind of grew up in this area, remember Casey Treat, right? He would often talk about, you know, I think he's still around, right? Oh, I don't hear much about him. I'm still trying to get my helicopter. I mean, if he's going to be getting a helicopter, I got to get my helicopter. But that's after we get the portable in. Next step, <laughs> pastor's helicopter. I got a pilot. We got the pilot right there. And if Bill were here, we'd have the mechanic. So we're set. I mean, I'm just... Just make well, sure it's a flat roof so you can land. Well, right. No, that's what the cargo container's for. <laughs> pastor's here. <laughs> So, so, <laughs> I mean, trips to the grocery store, can you imagine that? Set her down right there. I just cleared and put in the store. Yeah. What's going on? Mrs. Wilcox is grocery shop. <laughs> oh, they would, all, they would all go like that. Oh, okay. That makes sense. <laughs> so, um. So Casey Tree would often talk about, you know, I was a drug addict, I was in jail, all this stuff happened to me, and then I, you know, I came to know Jesus. Now, of course, that can be true, right? But what's the purpose of it, right? It's that, it's that personal conversion experience. That, that do you know? Do you really know that you're converted? Well, back up the train here. What does that say about um, baptism? An infant baptism, right? Well, I don't know. Did I really have a conversion experience there? I don't have a memory of it, right? So this, this, you can see how this creates a number of issues uh, with that kind of thing. Tom, your hand. Well, I was going to ask that about baptism yeah. because uh, <clears throat> you even had people like uh, President Carter that talked about being born again. Oh, sure, right. And uh, so how do they view... The infant baptism, not that they, they're for it, but how do they view it? In other words, right. us misguided people. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, typically in your, your non-denominational evangelical type churches, they don't practice it. I don't think they necessarily, depends on the, maybe the group, they wouldn't necessarily preach against it, um, but they certainly wouldn't preach for it because they're depending upon your choice, right? This, this kind of personal choice. Um, so, but I have heard of some congregations where their pastors have gotten curious about Lutheranism, and so they've gone into the confessions, and they've read the confessions, and they've seen what the Lutheran pastors and theologians had to say about baptism, and became convinced, you know, on the basis of good scriptural reasoning, like, this is a good thing to do. So they practice it in their churches. Hallelujah, that's great, more people being saved. Yeah? Hey, um, I, from experience, I, I found that some of them do what's called a dedication. Yes, you hear about that a lot. And then, then when that child is ready to get baptized, then they'll let them get baptized. But they do, like, they become a child of God through this dedication, and then... Yeah, there's this kind of almost this false notion that by virtue of the faith of your parents, you are part of the covenant people and therefore are saved. And, you know, I, I get it, right? We pass our faith on, right? We share it with our kids. Um, but that, I don't know, right? It's not quite what Scripture says. Well, there's just two, thing, two things anyways. Um, so I know that some, they will, they will draw parallels to circumcision sure and so therefore it is like kind of like that well you're set you're set apart you're, yes. going, you're going to be raised in the faith so they'll take it like that and then other ones Caitlin just mentioned he's like 
a lot of times they'll, they'll this, this is why people like get rebaptized ten times. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or if you're baptized as an infant, you have so to be rebaptized re because it wasn't it wasn't real. You know? Right. So yeah, if I've made this yeah. decision and then fell away, you know, I did something bad, I cheated on my wife or something like that, then oh man, I was not faithful to my vow, my baptismal grace. Better get rebaptized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've heard of people refer to our baptism as the Lutheran baptism, right. <laughs> which I think means infant baptism. They're like, For sure. yeah, you had a Lutheran baptism, so you know you got to do it again. Right. Kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> so um, I think sometimes it's useful. I, I I haven't tried this out yet, so next time you're you're talking to somebody, see what they have to say. But it would be interesting to have the conversation about you know Lutheran baptism. You'll be rebaptized and say, well. What we do is we practice confirmation. Yeah. And when you're older, you do announce to God and to your congregation that you want to be faithful and you ask God's blessings. You know, that's, and maybe help them get over that hump a little bit. Like, yeah. we're not, because sometimes I think, like, oh, see, you're not really taking your faith seriously. You're not ready to stand on it. It's like, oh, yeah, we kind of are. <laughs> but we just do it differently than, than what you do it. And we think you're maybe devaluing baptism just a little bit. Gary? The dangerous part about the personal consciousness is it, can, it, it causes doubt with people that haven't had this miraculous experience. Um, I work for a, a company that had bre prayer breakfasts. And if you couldn't get up in the prayer breakfast and, and give them the date, the time, the exact minute of when you got converted, yeah. then you were looked upon like you weren't really Christian now. Right. So, all right. Um, so you can you can clearly see what what took place as Pietism crossed the Atlantic into um, you know the pioneer days. Of American history, which is kind of where we're we're headed next in rationalism. Um, so, other just kind of more general effects that Pietism had on worship is um, the 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 hymns that they did sing were arranged by the order of salvation. You know, so uh, you weren't a believer, then the Holy Spirit worked on you, or somebody worked on you, you became a believer. So, um, I'm not sure what categories specifically. You know how we kind of organize it by the church here. Um, they would organize it by order of salvation because that's the focus, right? The focus is on your experience, and so they kind of arrange their hymns that way, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, the melodies, you know, become a little bit more um, emotional, and again, we don't want to just trash emotions in worship, but again, the purpose of it. What's the purpose of it? Um, they uh, so uh, they would take. Um, uh, the opera, right, which is very sentimental, these arias, these beautiful songs, you know, things like that, and they kind of pattern some of their music after that, which is kind of interesting. So I think probably the, the biggest thing to take away from this is in worship, um, remember we've got, in, in worship, um, we, we had that proclamation praise thing. Remember this? All praise is proclamation, all proclamation is praise. So when God or his you know, servant proclaims gospel to you, it elicits you to praise God for what he's done. So there's this beautiful kind of this, you know, back and forth, right? God shares his message, we respond. God shares his message, we respond. And song, acts of praise, all those things are part of that. Um, but this pietism destroys that, right? And it, and it just kind of focuses on, on just sort of this idea of my praise, you know, my worship, my experience, my piety, all that. Um, so um, it's about what you do, right? So in a word, if you're going to take pietism and just sum it up, all that we talked about would be anti-ritual. Because the rituals which, which proclaimed the means of grace were identified incorrectly as the source of the dead orthodoxy. And once they started stepping away from the rituals, it wasn't long before they started stepping away from the gospel, right? So, um, 
So, this then crosses the Atlantic, becomes rationalism. And really that was already going on in, in Europe too. But <clears throat> rationalism is going to form a big part of American Christianity, and still does to this day. And it did have its impact on Lutheranism in the U.S. <coughs> well, what year are we talking? Wonderful. Yeah, 1650. Okay. Uh, till about the late 1700s. So, say 50, 60 years. Or say about 100 years, sorry. About 100 years. Um, Uh, this is, you know, if you want to call it the, the Great Awakening or the Enlightenment. And worship became valued in this period because um, it was edifying, not because it carried the means of grace. Now, you're going to say to me, well, wait a second. You know, I come to church, I hear the gospel, I'm edified. Is that wrong? Of course not. <laughs> of course not. But was the means of grace proclaimed? Right? What's our measure for a worship service being faithful? Right? Did we proclaim Jesus? Because we can all go upstairs and I can give you 10 tips on how to be a better spouse or 10 tips on how to be a better kid or something like that. And it'd be very edifying. Right? We can sing about it. We can talk about it. You, know, you can go and watch a motivational speaker and be edified in that, right? But if it's not the means of grace doing the edifying, then it's not worship. So that's that's the distinction that we have to make here. So, of course we want service to be edifying. <laughs> I want you guys to have your hearts touched by the gospel message. That is a part of this. Um, but um, that can't be where all the focus is, because then all of a sudden we start becoming manipulative of that response, right? Like, I don't judge the effect of the means of grace by how many teary eyes are out in the congregation, right? If I did, right, then we'd have to work you guys all up every Sunday. And those of us who are more stoic than others, I'd never get you. Like, Why aren't you crying yet? Come on! <laughs> right? It's just, that wouldn't be a good way to do it, right? So, we say, was Jesus proclaimed? Absolutely. And of course, Going back to the four principles of worship, right? Let the gospel predominate, let the people participate, let all the best gifts of God be used, let the history of the church be honored. You take those, and that's kind of your practical side of that, que of that question. Was the gospel proclaimed? Yes. Did I honor those four things? Yes. Generally speaking, you're probably going to have a good worship service that Sunday, right? Um, so... Um, so in this kind of period here, uh, this idea of descending into rationalism, um, you had basically a service was like um, your typical service, let's say, worship service. It was a hymn, uh, a scripture reading, uh, the sermon, And a prayer. Boom. In and out, man. If you've done it in half an hour. <laughs> right? Maybe less. Does anybody... Now, um, this is one area where you might have had some personal experience. Where you might, years ago, remember. Yeah, there was only one lesson on Sunday morning. And that's a carryover from, from pietism's influence into Lutheranism. It, you know... It took us a little while to, to work the forms back to having more than one lesson in God's work. Because you're talking, you know, you've got 100 years of tradition now being established. So, so if you remember that, um, that's why. That's, that's one of the maybe more notable things. Yeah, Jim. You talk about Bach? Uh, that's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, because Bach was a really strong, and we're going to come, we're going to talk about music in the church here a little bit later. Um, but, 
Yeah, he was a very strong Lutheran composer, right? He would take these beautiful hymns and, you know, uh, the beauty of studying Bach is, um, is he forces you to, to find the melody. So, um, ah, I had it in my head, I can't hum it at the moment. Um, we all know that basic melody, right? And then he will weave that in throughout the whole piece. Yeah, it'll be all over the place, right? As an organist, right? Sometimes it's in the hands, sometimes it's in the feet. So <laughs> it's tough, yeah, right. So, but, but he's kind of forced, so this melody is carrying the message, right? And he's forcing you to kind of really pay attention and listen for where that shows up, right? So, um, yeah, that's, that's going to be a tricky thing um, for people because they're just not singing it. And, of course, the stuff he's writing music for are those, you know, hymns that spoke all the doctrine and spoke all these things that they were trying to kind of part company with. So, so yeah, Bach kind of gets locked up in a closet for a while and... and Finally, you know, it gets rediscovered. Uh, by the way, interesting side note on Bach. Um, if you've ever read, oh man, it's a silly book. Um, I'm going to say a few things. If it doesn't make sense, I apologize. Um, electric, electric powered monks. No? Okay. Yes, I just can't remember the guy's name. Something, something, Holistic Detective Agency. Oh, Dirk Gently? Dirk Gently. Yeah, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. It's kind of a sci-fi detective book. Um, and uh, part, part of the, there's, it's, it's sort of a little bit like uh, uh, a cult kind of classic movie where, you know, you got a group of people that know all the parts of it. Um, Part of it is he has to move a couch out of his apartment and it gets stuck in the stairwell and for the whole book it's just stuck there. Nobody can figure out how to get it out. I think that's supposed to be symbolic of something. Yeah. But, uh, <coughs> yeah? Pivot. Pivot? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I wondered if that wasn't a kind of reference to that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, this is a multi-layered conversation. I apologize. <laughs> There's many, many of you layers here. At any rate, at the end of the book, um, they are, they're discovering the most perfect piece of music ever played, and it's Bach. That, that's what made me think of it. Um, Bach's music starts playing, and they consider that. So, this, so it's an interesting thing that sort of popular culture has at times latched on to Bach's music and said, wow, this is perfect. Like, this is, this is to be, you know, to do better than Bach would be almost unthinkable. Right? You know, so there's that kind of notion now. Um, but I think, yes, in the church, we kind of got away from him for a little while. Um, this means, of course, yet you're not going to have communion too much. Um, so between 1723 and 1750, only about 14,000 to 18,000 communed a year in Leipzig. Now that sounds like a big number, but you know, you'd say you got a population of 150,000 or 200, 300,000. Right? It's a very small percentage of the population. By 1850, that number had dropped to only 3,000. So, um, and and that's maybe a couple times a year. Um, did I put this quote in here? Yeah. Look on the bottom of that page there. Note this form for the distribution of Holy Communion. Um, this is from the agenda of Schleswig-Holstein uh, by, by Christian Sintinus, 1808. Eat this bread. May the spirit of devotion rest upon you with all its blessings. Drink a little wine. Moral power does not reside in this wine, but in you, in the teachings of God and in God. Use this bread in remembrance of Jesus Christ, that the hungers of pure and noble virtue shall be filled. Drink a little wine. He that thirsts after pure and noble virtue shall not long for it in vain. So, so where is Jesus and all of that, right? There's this, it's just been totally turned into, you know, motivational speaking, right? This whole idea of enlightenment the, and, and virtue. 
It, when I read that, I thought about um, the Unitarian Universalist churches. You know, that, that this is what they kind of sound like. You know, just, just a whole bunch of you can do it, hoorah, rah, let's go human and <laughs> conquer and do good and things like that. Very much reliant upon the natural knowledge of God. Yeah? Um, it's interesting because this mindset, first of all, you're talking about, you know, maybe once or twice a year of communion. My, my dad and mom, my dad would always say, why do we need to have communion more than once a month? And we could only have it once or twice a year and we'd be fine. And I was always kind of confused by that, but he was raised by people who were very much influenced by the pietistic movement, so sure. communion wasn't that important. And to be fair to Lutherans, too, even in the 1600s, Luther thought, you know, hey, if we could have communion a couple times a year, that would be an improvement. So already, coming out of Roman Catholicism, you weren't celebrating the sacrament that much. But certainly... As you know, that teaching grew, and Lutheranism's under, Lutherans understood the value of Holy Communion, it became more frequent. Sorry, I cut you off. Oh no, it was just you know, we get to the point where at our congregation, if you wanted communion every week, you could go because either service would offer it, right. you know, either first, first or second service, and you know, I was like, this is a good thing, and right. we had a conversation about it. But. <laughs> yeah, my first congregation I served, there was a guy there once, once a year. The once a year communion guy. The only time he came up more than once is I preached a sermon on coming to communion more than once a year. Not well, not quite like that, but I preached a sermon on communion, so I think he felt compelled to come up. That guy felt bad about that one. Like, I hope you're coming up for the right reasons. Okay, uh, where am I at here? Um, okay, r rationalism becomes revivalism in America. Ration. I can spell. There it is. Revival. All right. This is a truly unique phenomenon in the United States. This really didn't happen anywhere else. If it shows up anywhere else in the world, it came out of America. Kind of like if you go to Russia, you know, go to Moscow, and you go to a jazz bar. The only reason I have a jazz bar there is because we came up with it first, right? So, uh, so this is a truly American thing. Um, so the Lutheran pastors that came to the U.S. were generally pietistic. Um, what, what overlooked the field of Gettysburg on the hill there? Anybody know? There's a Lutheran, there, seminary. There's a Lutheran seminary up there. Yeah, there's a Lutheran seminary. So that Gettysburg seminary um, graduated about two generations of pietistic pastors. So that's what was feeding a lot of the Lutheran congregations in those days. So they were very open to the ideas of revivalism. You have to understand, at this period in American history, you didn't have really well-organized synods in the U.S. You had pastoral associations, like ministeriums, where, okay, there's a Lutheran pastor over there, there's a Lutheran pastor over there, hey, we should work together and do some work together. Okay, cool. We'll call ourselves a ministerium, and that's just kind of how it went for a long time. <coughs> and then you had, I mean, you want to study weird synodical history, just, yeah, try to find Lutheran synods in the United States for the past 200 years, and there's a bucket load of them. They have mergers and breakups and splits and all these things that happen over the years. Um, now, revivalism did not come from pietism, okay? But pietism latches on to it and says, aha, we can do it. So, so you know, Gary, let's say, you're the Lutheran pietistic pastor, just graduated from the Gettysburg Seminary. How do you do church? Hmm. Well, that Arminian church over there, they, 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 we think alike, right? They're really into your decision for Christ. I'm really into the conversion experience. So, so they latch on to um, Arminianism. So, so revivalism come, comes out of this thing we call Arminianism. And if you know a guy by the name of John Wesley, that's our fellow. Uh, he, he was a Methodist, English Methodism. And he was coming over on the boat, and it was a not too pleasant journey coming across the Atlantic, but he was really impressed by these guys, these Christians that call themselves Arminian. Like they have this confidence and this calm, 
And so he starts talking with them, and uh, and he's kind of convinced, like, yeah, okay, you guys, you guys have a really good understanding of of you know conversion experience and all this stuff. So um, so uh, John Wesley um, comes over to the United States, and he's kind of a born again Christian now, and and he starts working with the pioneer families, um, reaching out to them as they're you know that westward expansion. And another fellow you should know is Charles Finney. Uh, he was a lawyer that became a Presbyterian preacher. Presbyterian. Um, so you came, right? Uh, do you guys talk about Charles Finney much in the Presbyterian world? Okay. No, and, and most of the Presbyterian churches are, are not. Revivalist. Yeah, right. I think it's changed. <laughs> they, they have moved the from Yeah, yeah, I was going to say. Uh, but let's put his dates down. You know, and you're in a time period here where there's just not a lot of um, official stuff. You know, everything's kind of in flux. You've got this group of Christians here, you've got this group of Christians here. But, man, you get out into the pioneer places, and what do you have for church, right? There's no Catholic priest to go to, right? So these guys kind of get to the forefront of that and it's sort of whoever's there becomes sort of the local pastor in the area. <clears throat> so um, so Finney's, Finney's point here, and we're, we're not doing all this great justice here, but we're just looking at influences. Fin Finney's point was um, uh, a revival worship service was just the philosophical result of the right use of means. All right, so let's let's set this up. Uh, I'm a revivalist preacher. Out in the pioneers, throw my tent up, right? Put the hay bales around, and you know, get the singers in, get the people in. Come, 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 come see. You know, and we're preaching, we're preaching, we're preaching. And Jacob, you're looking, you're looking like you're ready to make your decision. We have this little chair up here. Come here, sit here. Come here, sit here. Oh, yeah. This is what we call the anxious seat. This is the anxious seat. He's getting ready to make his decision. And we're going we're gonna to get him ready. We're going to get him ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woo. And he jumps up on the altar and he's ready. Woo. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. You never know when you're going to get drawn into things. So. Um, and all he is saying here is, is um, we, we designed a worship service, right, to, to angle people to make the right decision, right? That's, Arminianism is, um, uh, if, if you hear of decision theology, right, you got to make your decision for Christ. I've made Jesus the Lord and Master of your life, um, I don't know why this happens in guys' bathrooms. This is weird. But occasionally you'll see a Christian tract in a guy's bathroom, like by the sink or on the urinal. It's the weirdest thing. I don't know. So, but you pick up this religious tract and you read it through, and it tells you the story of this person. They went through all those trials and temptations. and Then on the back, they turn their life over to Jesus, and life is great. And then they have a prayer at the bottom. If you pray this, if you feel serious about this, you pray this prayer and ask Jesus to come into your heart, you know, then you can be saved. Right? So there's always something you got to do. So that's kind of the, the, the trick of Arminianism. And Finney latches onto it. He's like, okay, if it's about decisions, how do we get people to make that decision? Well, why don't we fire them up emotionally? Right? Get them stirred in their spirit. And then get them on the anxious seat. And boom, they're ready to make their decision. Yeah. Not, not to distract here. Um, so how does, holy, how does holiness fit into... The holiness movements. And that comes from John Wesley too, doesn't it? Well, right. So a lot of these, yeah, yeah. You know, so, okay, you've made your decision. Now you have to be consistent with your decision. Okay. Right? So you better live the right kind of life. Don't drink. You know, don't gamble. All these rules. So so this is how you then prove you're, okay. you're one of God's children. Yeah. Okay. So and, and to greater and lesser extents. Right? The, the holiness movements are kind of a thing unto themselves, but they, they spin off of mm -hmm. revivalism, right? Well, I know these, the same people have their fingers in all those yeah. pies, so mm -hmm. that was, anyways. Yes, so, and, and, you know, I'm sure if I had, 
you know, four Methodists up here, four Methodist theologians, they would have their own perspectives on this as well. Okay. <clears throat> um, so in revivalism, um, if, if the worship form, so the form of worship, the style of worship, if that gained you a convert, right on. Good. That's a good worship service. If not, then we reject it. So the stress was placed on uh, outward success, right? So um, I think this was in Rapid City. Um, uh, a big revival was coming through town. Yeah. They had rented out, you know, the big town uh, amphitheater, and then they were soliciting area pastors to help in the post-service, post-decision room. So. So I got a card and it said, hey, you can help out. What happens is people make their altar call, and when they're done with the altar call, they got to go into this special room where you're going to talk to them a little bit more and make sure they understand, kind of, you know, close the deal kind of a thing, right? Right? You were up on stage, the price was right, you won the car, now, now you got to pay the price, you know, <laughs> kind of a thing. So they, were, they, were, they just sent a card out to all the pastors, kind of saying, hey, can you help us out with this? Which gave me a really interesting perspective. Uh, I've never gotten something like that before, but, uh, or, or since. Um, so, so the whole thing is just, it's... So this... Um, all right, what am I at here? So, so the idea is, um, you know, experiential hymns. Right? Get them moving. Um, compelling choir anthems. A lot of great choir pieces from this, this period. Uh, you know, that, that great gospel music, right? If you've ever listened to that, man, good stuff there. Um, fiery preaching, sure. Um, yeah, the anxious bench, the anxious seat. And yeah, Gary, Gary, the Pietistic Lutheran pastor, says, "I like all of these things. That is what we're going to do in my Lutheran church, and that's." That's kind of your, your general Lutheranism in America at that time. Wow, is that different? That is so different, right? All right, so you tell me, what are the results of this going to be in the church? I don't know what the results are going to be, but I've been thinking through this whole thing. Somebody here knows more about brain research than I do and can clean up my mistakes, but modern re brain research shows that if you appeal to the emotions, the logical part of your brain can't even engage. Is that pretty accurate? Well, I think, right? I mean, we've all experienced that. You go, you know, say, hey, we gotta buy a new car. Let's go buy a new car. Okay, we're gonna go car shopping, right? And what's the what's the salesman gonna do, right? Get you all fired up about this car, right? And he can't see anything but what he's throwing out to you, right? And it is. So, you know, you, <laughs> you got to take a step back. We need a day to think about this. So I don't know if I can give you a day. I don't know if I, there's somebody else. They were just didn't look at that car, you know. And in our case, it was the Mazda, that was true. <laughs> he drove away the day we went to pay for it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Never say that. That doesn't work on me. That's okay, right, right. You can take him to use car trips. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> well, and this is, you know. I sweat it out while I get him to knock off the last 50 cents. <laughs> Yeah, this is why being like a door-to-door -door salesman is not a good thing with me because I usually say, give me your card, I'll call you in a week because i got to think about this. <laughs> Dude, I, yeah, the one guy actually yelled at me, he's like, you don't understand how this works, he said to me. Sorry, man. <laughs> no, I actually do understand how You can move on to the next victim, I mean next house. <laughs> okay. So all this is focused on self, isn't it? Right? I think that's the big takeaway here. Um, you know, if I'm focused on myself, I'm not focused on Jesus. And so we, <laughs> we abandon Jesus. We abandon the core gospel message. So, so in Lutheranism, right, the effects on Lutheranism were a loss of all the solas, right? Sola gratia, by grace alone. Sola 
fide, by faith alone. Sola scriptura, by scripture alone. Right? You lose these things. You lose these things. And, um, and what were the symptoms of that? So, how, what things would I be looking for to see? Has there been a, um, a pietistic or um, a rationalistic influence in that congregation? Well, one of, the, one of the symptoms was an abandonment of liturgy. And um, an abandonment of those principles of worship. The four principles, let the people participate, gospel predominate, those things. And if you saw those kind of two things together, well, then you, you had a good chance that um, you're not going to hear about grace, faith, and scripture. Right? You're going to hear about yourself a lot. All right. Don't worry, though, because we love round numbers. We love round numbers. And the year 300 came around. And that was significant because the year was 1817. All right, subtract 300, you have 1517. What great event are we celebrating the 300th anniversary of? Reformation. Yeah, it's Reformation time. We just did 500, right? So Reformation time. All of a sudden there was this kind of renewed interest amongst, hey, I'm a Lutheran. I heard that Luther guy was kind of important once, um, even at my Gettysburg Seminary. He's kind of an important guy. We should study him. We should learn what he wrote about. Wow. Okay. Eyes were opened, let's say. Right? And all of a sudden you had Lutherans kind of bending back towards classical Lutheranism, which is, of course, back to the means of grace, back to Christ as the focus of worship, um, and back to these principles of worship. So that, that's going to take a little while to work its way out. Um, 1817, by the way, um, is a, a few years shy of the founding of the Wisconsin Synod. So right at the beginning of our Wisconsin Synod, we actually started out a little bit more pietistic. Um, our early pastors working there in, you know, in the Milwaukee area, um, you know, came out of those seminaries. And so that's what they started with. It wasn't until uh, a little period that we call the Wauwatosa theology when uh, a seminary was started in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. Um, and you had J.P. Kaler there. Um, Peeper, thank you. You had Kretzman. So you had these guys that knew their stuff. They went back. Their point was go back to the original languages. Go back and study scripture. Go back and, and understand what is God trying to say. And that, that changed our, our synodical trajectory, right? If those, the Lord hadn't sent those men to us, um, our trajectory would have been much different, I'm sure of it. Okay, got a few minutes here for some last minute discussion questions. How might we see pietism today creeping in? We kind of talked a little bit about this, but where do you see, where do you see some of these influences? Maybe not just in Lutheran worship, but just in Christianity in general. Sure. Yeah, that kind of fiery preaching. Yeah, and, you know, I know we, we're, we're, are we talking revivalism? Are we talking pietism? And they both share a lot. <coughs> both share a lot together. Well, it's all, didn't, didn't Luther just refer to that all as enthusiasm? It's just like it's its own. Yeah, the Schwermer, he called them. The Schwermer. You know, the, they're all kind of buzzy and busy and schwermer you know. <laughs> you know, I can't. Really, there's no like English word for that. It's just, they're just sort of busy. They're all over the place. You know, I can't pin them down. What do you believe? I don't know. It's all about feelings. Schwerer. <coughs> Which, Josh is laughing because, dear sainted Professor Deutschland, if you said anything wrong, <laughs> that name would get you right. Yeah. If you're a Schwerer, you know, you were, you were saying the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, how might, how might, this is an important question, how might a liturgical service pr 
protect from pietism. How might a liturgical service protect us from that? It keeps it keeps you <laughs> it keeps you on a schedule. Like it keeps you focused on on God and Scripture. There's no room in a liturgical service to kind of break away and talk about the self, and it just keeps bringing you back, bringing your focus back. Is organization, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, right, so it's set up, right, so that you're hearing about Christ. Remember when we talked about parts of the liturgy, right, it's all about that Sunday to Sunday review of the work of Christ. So it helps you keep that front and center, right? Good? Um, why would a liturgical service ever be accused of being void or meaningless or out of touch and thus boring and stodgy and wooden? When would, when would that happen? Well, if the uh, pietistic uh, services are more like, yeah, let's get all right up. Then, then, well, yeah, the liturgical service uh, would be very boring compared to Okay, right. Yeah, the two are kind of in a different... It's like, am I going to go ride carnival rides? Or am I going to go to the museum and look at pictures of art? You know, it's two totally different things, right? And if I've got a group of a thousand people and I'm selling five dollar tickets to the museum or the carnival ride, well, not, not to be mean to humans here, but I'm going to guess I'm going to sell more tickets for the carnival rides, probably, right? It's just... It's hard to pit those two against each other. I lost other. it. You, I'm sorry. That's fine. That's what, I lost you at Carnival? You had me at Carnival, Pastor. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I, got, I got it oh, again. Oh, sorry. Go Hold your thought. Um, well, the liturgical service is not meant to, it's not entertainment. Yes. And so it's like being able to be mature enough to understand where, where entertainment is appropriate and where it is not. Yes. Good. And so... It's like, if you can't recognize that you don't need to be entertained all the time, you're, of course you're going to think the liturgy is boring. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh. Right. Yep. And that's why you got to talk about this from time to time. What? They got candy and butter. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> all right, last quick thought here. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. I think it becomes that way when, it's, when you worship passively. Because then, you're, you, we're, we have a society that is used to consuming, right? And so we want entertainment. So if you go to a church looking for that, you're passively, like, you just get roads. Of course it's going to be boring, right? So you're not even thinking about what you're doing. Yeah, it's so crazy. Yeah. It, your mindset going into it really matters, which is kind of what you were talking about, too, right? It's work. It takes a lot of work to right. work. You do have to actually pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> right? And actually think about what you're saying. You're saying it. All right, now, is there a lesson we can learn, though, from pietism? Does it teach us anything good that we can take away? So I think I think there is, but I'd be curious what your thoughts are first. Yeah. Um, human beings. And human being beings. Human, and having those human relationships, that's, I mean, that's what Jesus did. He spread the gospel through his relationships with the people around him, and we can't just forget that. Yeah, yeah, but the human, the human, yeah element in a worship service is still a rational, emotional, spiritual being. We've got to talk to the whole person there. Did I steal your thunder? No, oh, you didn't steal anything. <laughs> um, I think that some of the risk of a liturgical service is it can be empty and out of touch as well. And so finding that back, I mean, if, if there is a volcano that, you know, Mount Rainier explodes, right, everybody's running away and you, you go to church and... Yeah. You're, you're talking about, you know, I, I don't know, Mar you know, Mary and Martha, and, and there's just no right. actual connection <laughs> with what's going, you know, this gigantic disaster. Well, I, sure. Yeah. You know, I think it can run that way, and there's a risk of that. Yes. And so being aware of that and counteracting that is important as well. Yeah, I think, yeah, just being sensitive to the needs of the people in your community, what's going on, mm -hmm. and, you know, there's variance there, there's right? Yep. How many sermons on COVID was I supposed to preach? How many was too many, right? How many times did we bring that up, right? Okay, Pastor, you heard about a hundred times. I'm good, right? I, I remember um, you know, Mrs. Wilcox was telling me the kids in chapel were a little tired of all the pastors coming and preaching about COVID and COVID and COVID and COVID. And finally, they just heard a, certain, they just heard a, a chapel on Jesus, and they were like, oh, that was nice. <laughs> and no, no harm to the guys that were going in there, because it, 
it was on everybody's minds. It was just what we were thinking about. So that's just what you do. But um, yeah, there's, there's that balance in those things. Yeah, I think I, I like that, you know, just this idea of the human element. We have a person sitting in that pew. How is God's word going to speak to that person today? So practical preaching, preaching that's relatable, you know, preaching that, that doesn't rely on a lot of jargon and terminology. You try to avoid that. Sometimes, you know, it just you have to. Um, or you don't have 20 minutes to explain one thing. So that's, a, that's an art form, I'll, I'll admit. Um, I know we've talked a lot as we move through this on how do we help people understand the parts of the service as we move our way through. That's, that's another benefit to helping that person understand why am I here, what, what's happening uh, in, this, in this service. So, um, so pietism can help remind us, I think, that, that there are people with human needs and emotions that, that do need to be met. And of course, that, that's what leads me to conclude that that was the ultimate cause of pietism, was we forgot that. We emphasized the doctrine and the teachings, but we forgot how to connect those to the heart of a person. And really, yeah, go back to Jesus. Look at how he dealt with people and, and, and find your, your encouragement there. All right, I think our next unit is going to be on music. So we get to listen to some good old music. Um, we might even go upstairs and then um, uh, find some way. If I can get a camera up there, um, I think it's, you know, not that all of you are going to learn how to play the organ or anything like that, but I think it's important to understand how and why an organ is designed the way it is and help you appreciate what organists do and things like that. So we'll have a little bit of fun with that too. So. So that's coming. Hymns and things. We'll, we'll do some hymn singing. That'll be fun. So, Mr. Roth, I might put you on the spot for a few anthems, songs, things. Thank you. Prep the buck. Prep the buck. <laughs> please, by next Sunday. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us uh, perspective, an opportunity to learn from history and and to apply those teachings right now into our lives. Uh, many, many people have come before us and have, have contended for the truth of your word, and we thank you for those people. And even when we see mistakes that were made in our, our past, uh, those also are opportunities for us to learn and grow. Um, that's true in our life too, Lord. Thank you for those chances and opportunities. Thank you for the many people um, who bless us every day and bless us as we continue to grow in your word. Amen. All right, folks, guys online, thanks for joining us.